Good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. I see that it's about seven o'clock on my time here in, in Texas. Uh, what I'll do tonight, go ahead and get things kicked off with introducing myself. My name is Aaron Summerall. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach and Research for Pig Brig Trap Systems. And uh, tonight we're gonna go into one of our, our pre-scheduled topics on our webinars, talking about some ag damage and, and how those pigs are impacting that ag, ag damage. So before we get kicked off in that topic, though, we got a couple other guys that are joining me tonight that are part of my team or part of the team that I get the opportunity to serve on. And I want to let them give uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves, too. So, Ryan, I'll go ahead and turn it to you and, and tell them tell them who you are, what you do. Yep. Uh, I'm one of the members of the trap support team, along with Marshall. Uh, I also work full time for the company that developed the trap system, uh, White Buffalo Incorporated. So uh, I help out with the with the tech support on the trap. So if you guys have questions about uh, trapping pigs, um, T-post mounts, ground anchors, uh, really anything to do with the trap, you have problems conditioning pigs, if you give a call on the pig rig line 833-744-2744 and you dial extension two, you'll pick up either Marshall or I. So uh, that's a little bit about me. I'm sure some of you probably seen me on some of the videos about the drive rod trick or rebar trick or some of the other stuff. So turn it over to Marshall and uh, thank you guys for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Hey guys, I'm Marshall. I'm the other trap support guy. Good deal, Marshall. Appreciate it. The, one of the things to kind of keep in mind, folks, is that that all of us on the team, we, we're we kind of scattered out where you need us to be, where we can help out most and foremost. Is, and, and with that, Ryan is in Indiana. And uh, and Marshall is in Georgia, so uh, and I'm I'm in Texas, so we've got a, we got folks that are kind of scattered around that we can we can get to you pretty quick, kind of know the situation of what you're facing and, and how to be able to to best help you with the situation you're you're in or where you may be located. Uh, one of the first things I want to do tonight before we get kicked off is is later on in the evening we'll we'll start receiving questions through the Q and A part of the 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 feature here tonight to answer anything that you may have. Uh, that we didn't cover, didn't cover appropriately. So if you'll notice there, that Q&A feature, the chat feature that's in the, those those icon boxes, if you would give us a thumbs up or a, a hi or, or, or whatever you choose to do to let us know that you're there. So we know that you've got that chat feature figured out and we know to, to move forward uh, and being able to answer your questions. So if you could go ahead and hit that chat feature up, we'll see that coming through. Uh, tonight, Marshall is gonna be our MC of just perfection and be able to make sure that, uh, that I can answer some of those questions as we move through, as well as anything else that, that Ryan or Marshall may wanna to add to uh, as we go through. So uh, without further ado, what we're gonna do is get into the, to, to the topics tonight. And uh, before we get into tonight's topic, some of the upcoming webinars that we have already planned out for you is, uh, is there on the screen. And tonight, obviously we're gonna be working on the the ins and out about the impacts on agriculture and, and so forth and uh, cover a lot of natural resources uh, inclusions there as well. But next month, we're gonna be talking about those urban environments and fragmented landscapes. And that's gonna be something that's uh, highly uh, informative because of the, just the nature of what people are doing now. Uh, we are seeing a lot more, I guess, impacts or, or interference in those urban landscapes. Uh, as well as, I mean, everybody wants to own a piece of the a piece of the world out there. Whenever we start fragmenting that land off, we start seeing those pigs start selecting for some of those management uh, approaches in those fragmented landscapes. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in August, uh, and then follow it on with some th things in September through the fall. That's going to be uh, topics that you can include at trap locations at the trap site. Uh, that's going to improve your your catch efficiencies as well as non-target species avoidance and things of that nature. So uh, a couple of those things coming up pretty quickly are going to be specific to hands on the ground or hands on the on and boots on the ground type topics. And Marshall and Ryan will be in there with with those topics as well. So kind of start thinking about some of those those questions that you may have. Uh, if we can address those topics in the in the presentation itself, that would be great. So if you've got them. Uh, they've got those questions before we get to those topics uh, specifically. Go ahead and fire those out to us on pigbrig.com, and we'll make sure that we include those in the presentation. If not, we'll we'll address them at the, at the during the presentation itself. So with that, what we'll do, we're going to go ahead and kick off tonight. 
uh, with the impacts on, on, on agriculture and how pigs are affecting the land and so forth and so on. Uh, and tonight too, again, just like everything is we're going to try to, to limit this to no more than an hour of your time. And that hour of your time is going to include uh, covering the topic as well as giving plenty of time to be able to ask those questions uh, toward the end of the, the, the presentation, toward the end of the evening. So we can make sure that you leave, leave, uh, with the information that you came for. So with that, first thing is first, whenever we talk about any kind of damage assessments, any kind of uh, economics related to pigs, we first have to know the number of pigs that are on the landscape. And sometimes that's almost like throwing uh, darts at a board. And we just, we try to, to give the best guess that we can, but the popular number that we see in academia and we see in published documents and research and so forth across the country, uh, what we're looking at is roughly 9 million pigs in, in the nation right now. And that's in just in the continental United States. Uh, but the concern there is, is something that even though we might not be able to put our thumb on the population itself, the concern is, is that what the data sets are telling us and those data sets, uh, depending on the region that you're in and the conditions that you may be facing, uh, those, those populations could be increasing as much as 25% every five years. And that can get astronomical and out of hand pretty quickly when we start thinking about that overall number. And, and you may not be interested if you're in Georgia where Marshall is, what the population's doing in Texas. But whenever we start thinking about other concerns that we need to keep in mind with that population increase and spread the way that it is, is that we look down at that second bubble there and it says we have breeding populations in 35 of those states. So as that population continues to expand the way that, that the data sets are showing us that it's doing, some of those peripheral states like where Ryan is at in Indiana and Ohio, maybe Kansas and Nebraska or Virginia, those can start seeing some of that spillover of that population expansion whenever we reach carrying capacity into some of those states that have just an abundance of pigs, those, those populations have to expand in some direction or another. So that's something to kind of keep in mind with that we have a, a, a situation on our hands that, that seems to, to, to be um, driving itself basically regardless of what that overall population is. Now, when we start thinking of the economic side of things, whenever we look at agriculture, residential, recreational damage, what we see that, that's pretty much the, the consensus across the United States is that that damage is gonna exceed about 2.5 billion annually. That's billion with a B, folks. So that's something that, that's also growing just like population. And, and the reason a lot of that pop, that number is growing into that 2.5 and, and, and excess billions of damage is the fact of how much commodities are worth now. Uh, we are seeing a lot more like next month's program is gonna talk about land fragmentation. Well, a lot of that land that's being fragmented is coming out of agriculture production, which means that's leaving us with less acres to actually farm to be able to supply the, 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 the product that needs to be supplied. So the commodities themselves are becoming more valuable, which means that those, I guess, decreasing amount of commodity there is going to be seeing an increased value, which means an increased damage value per pig each year. And when we think about that, the overall damage value right now across the country that what we're finding in, in, in research as well is for every pig out there on that landscape that's got a heartbeat, uh, we're looking at about $300 per pig per year in damage. So whenever you start thinking about a sounder that you may see that's got 30 individuals in that, uh, that's going to get pretty scary really quick on how much damage that sounder could potentially cause in a given area uh, during that during that 12 month period. With 300 being a benchmark, obviously there's going to be those states that that have higher values per pig and damage each year. And one of those is the state just to the north of me. And the state, obviously, to the north of me is Oklahoma, where Oklahoma is reporting pigs to have about $390 worth of damage per animal per year. So, again, depends on the commodity, depends on the individual year and the setting that you're at uh, as to how much that's going to fluctuate from one state to the other or even from one region to the other. But the last year that we had a full 12 months of valuable or usable data before we got hit with COVID is 2019 here in the state of Texas. In 2019, what we saw here, just an agriculture damage alone was between 230 and $240 million in ag damage alone. And that's at the farm level. So whenever we take that damage at the farm level, at that, that value just under a quarter of a billion dollars, we can think about that's direct loss. 
but who who out there is paying for that indirectly? And and that's pretty much going to lump everybody into that that category. Uh, a friend of mine once said that those that are affected by wild pigs are going to be those that buy clothes, live in a house, or they like to eat. And I think that's going to pretty much isolate everybody into one of those three categories. So directly at the farm level, what is it costing you right now at the at the the consumer level of buying it off the shelf? Uh, that could fluctuate again too based on state, but Kind of kicking things off with that as an introduction, these are some of the topics that we'll talk a little bit more about specifically tonight uh, with water quality, plant communities, wildlife, agriculture, public health, and food supply. Uh, some of these things tonight, we're going to treat this kind of like a, a, a motorboat and we're going to hit the tops of the waves uh, because some of these topics we're going to get into as specific topics later on in the webinar series and really dissect those much more in detail. So tonight we're going to basically plant that seed, make sure that you're aware of some of those, those big issues that are facing individual topics. And then later on, you may want to come back and join us for some of those specific topics as we really break those apart and get into them in detail. So moving to the next thing, first and foremost, you say that, well, you may not be directly uh, affected with, with agriculture or natural resources may not be something that you're really worried about with concern to plant communities or whatnot. But the last time I checked, all of us need water. And, and that's one of those things that we need to focus on tonight or today with what's going on is, is, is water contamination. Um, where Marshall's at right now in Georgia, I don't think there's probably a water uh, uh, quantity issue as much as there is a water quality issue. I mean, they, from what I understand, uh, some of that place and some of those places along the East Coast are getting plenty of water. Where I'm at right now in, in Texas, literally we have cracks in the ground that are three, three inches wide and you can put a shovel handle in them uh, and not touch the bottom. So whenever we start thinking about water quality, uh, it's a big issue for us right now because we don't have the quantity either. So what we have, we have to make sure that we have quality. And in some of those places that we see that, that problem is going to be in the increased runoff and sedimentation. And you say, well, you know, that's, that's still one of those things that I might not live in one of those areas that really don't affect me too much. And we'll talk about that as kind of as we go through tonight's topics. But what we need to think about right now with regard to riparian vegetation and runoff and sedimentation is the fact that, okay, you, you may not be directly affiliated with agriculture, but if you've got any kind of water on your property uh, that you might let the grandkids fish in, they may go swim in every once in a while, so forth and so on. A couple of things you need to keep in mind is one is in that runoff, obviously there's gonna be sedimentation. Whenever we start increasing sedimentation, which is any kind of a contaminant in the water, and a contaminant in this case is not used in a, in a word like a, a toxin or anything like that, it's any kind of a, extra addition into that water column uh, that could cause problems. And whenever we th start thinking about sedimentation, it's just any kind of a third grade science experiment. Whenever you put things into water, regardless of what that is, the, the, the ability of that water to hold heat goes up. So when we start thinking of that water, the ability of that water to hold more heat, the thing we need to think of next is, is as that water increases with heat, it decreases with dissolved oxygen. So whenever your water temperature goes up, the dissolved oxygen goes down. And when we think about dissolved oxygen going down, the first thing we need to think about is those big trophy bass that we got in that pond there that those kids like to catch and all that. Those bigger fish require a higher oxygen content. So whenever sedimentation goes up, water temperature goes up, the oxygen holding ability goes down. And whenever that oxygen holding ability goes down, then you start seeing some of those bigger, more trophy fish start sunning on you out there, then they're not going to turn over and go back to the bottom for you. So kind of keep those things in mind with regard to the sedimentation and how it can affect you. Then it moves into that second bullet point with that basic foundation already there with the sedimentation and runoff affecting the spread of bacteria. Whenever water temperature goes up, whenever water uh, uh, dissolved oxygen goes down, we see the higher likelihood that we're going to have bacterial uh, in inclusions in that water increase. So that hot water, that low dissolved oxygen in the water, that's going to be perfectly fine for those bacteria to increase uh, and, to, and to propagate throughout. So some of the things to kind of keep in mind there is, is that, that, that that muddy stream that you see coming out of that erosion off your field, 
uh, that those pigs messed up. It's not just going to end there where they made that hole in the field. It's going to continue to go on uh, into that waterway, if, especially if it's a flowing body. And that's not going to affect you as much as it possibly could be those folks downstream. So then also, too, moving into the next thing where, where the vast majority of us are in the southeast everything from texas all the way up to nebraska and then you go from that line to, from texas to nebraska to the east coast uh we're going to see this as being a major major issue uh, with regard to the the plant communities that are there um and we could have possibly flipped these two bullet points that are on the screen and that's kind of what i'm going to do tonight is is we start thinking about the out with the good when we think about out with the good, a lot of those the good those those good more desirable species that are on the landscape are going to be those large mass producing trees like your oaks, your hickories, your things like that. That's got that large seed that is highly sought after by those pigs. Whenever they drop those seeds on the ground, they are easy to find. They're easy to pick up. They're highly nutritious for that pig. They're not going to leave much there. For, for succession on those plants, those young uh, seedlings getting started, which we'd start losing a lot of that succession throughout the, the growth stages of those, those trees, increasing the girdling of valuable trees. A lot of you may be in the pine industry where we see a lot of pine plantations all over. Uh, a lot of those trees along the periphery of those pine plantations, you can see are girdled uh, by pigs, just like you would see a, maybe a light pole or whatnot. And those pigs are girdling a lot of those trees because they're looking for the sap that's in those trees uh, to use as a way to repel some of those uh, parasites, those external parasites uh, to, to give them a little bit of relief. But that's some of those things on out with the good uh, what we see. And, and obviously with every action, there is a, uh, obviously a reaction. So whenever we lose those good ones, we start coming in with those bads. And whenever I say those bads, they may be native, they may not be native. Uh, but more so what we're seeing is a lot of invasive species. And it may not be a a woody invasive species like a tree. It could be uh, uh, just just forbs, or it could be any kind of new weeds that may not be accustomed, may be native to that area. That things like quail and turkey and deer may use as a food source uh, in the native situation. They can't use them in an invasive in invasive species. But in the timber situation, where we see a lot of places where oak and hickory are on the decline, we start seeing other trees such as ash. Many of the ash varieties or ash uh, subspecies and uh, and uh, elm on the increase and those are obviously not large seed producers so we see plant communities start really changing shape in places that those pigs uh, have a, an extremely good foothold on there and uh, and some of those places that, that we see this there's actually been some correlation being drawn to the increase in in uh, in, in I guess or the changing rather of plant communities and the increasing likelihood of tree nesting bird succession. And when we start thinking about the tree nesting bird succession is that those plant communities that are native also have native insect communities that feed on those plants. And when we change up the plants, we change up the food that those insects are feeding on, which we can see adverse effects on there. And obviously whenever we have birds feeding their, their chicks in the nest, they're not seeing the food sources that they really need. This is something that, that that picture there on the right hand side, whenever I see this as a wildlife guy, this is what really makes my blood boil. Uh, whenever I look at that picture on the right hand side there, I mean, we have a, a non-native invasive species that is definitely taking advantage of one of our desirable native species that, that uh, definitely depends on some management to make sure they stay healthy. And when we start thinking about pigs and their damage on native wildlife species, we think about them in kind of in four different categories of how are they damaging those native wildlife species. And obviously like that picture on the right, uh, we see a direct predation there. Uh, we, we don't know, we can't quantify the number of, of species that we lose to pigs every year in those wildlife communities because we just simply don't know the number that we started with. And if we don't know the number we started with, we can't tell you how many or what percentage that they're removing from the landscape. We'll talk about in the next slide what we think they may be doing based on agriculture numbers, but in that wild situation, we don't know. Uh, one of the things that we do know on, on things that like uh, simulated nest sites for turkeys and quail, that wild pigs are, are definitely taking out the yeoman's share of those ground nesting bird clutches uh, just because of the feeding patterns that they have when they move across the landscape. And we obviously are seeing some 
uh, adverse effects to those losses of those ground nesting uh, bird clutches. So obviously the next thing is moving into that habitat destruction, which is some of what we talked about in riparian management. Uh, whenever those pigs come into those or those, those habitats, uh, they're going to stay in the habitat most all the time until that, that food source or that resource is depleted before they move on to the, to the next area. And, and whenever they move out of an area, that doesn't mean that they're gone for good. That just means that they're gone for now. Because as that, those pigs stay off that landscape uh, and that habitat tends to recover like mother nature allows it to, those pigs are gonna come back to it. So uh, that's something that we may see a temporary removal from the area, but that's not gonna stay there for that long. Then, then the next thing about the competition for food resources. Obviously the biggest situation that we face with, with regard to, to depredation or, or to loss of habitat is just because pigs are an omnivore, which basically means they're gonna eat everything that, that, that has a calorie. Uh, Billy Higginbotham, if any of you know who Billy Higginbotham is, um, he, that's the statement he made for years is that pigs are gonna eat anything with a calorie. And, and whenever we start thinking about food resources for other species, obviously pigs are gonna start out because I mean, in true, they're a pig. They're, they're lazy if they get the opportunity to be lazy. So any of those above ground resources that they have access to, they're gonna deplete those first before they start sticking that snout in the ground and tearing up the soil structures, looking for those, those, uh, those grubs and worms and things like that. The problem is, is what other native species are feeding on those above ground resources? And obviously it's pretty much everything we got out there from the quail to the deer and the elk and everything else. So those pigs are not gonna stick their snout in the ground unless they have to. And that's gonna be one of those things whenever the, the resources start to be depleted above ground, they're, they're gonna start looking below ground. This is one of the easy things that we can do whenever we start scouting for pigs is that many times I have uh, people tell me this and it's something that, that Marshall and Ryan may be able to echo is that, well, I don't have pigs on my property because I don't see damage. Well, what type of damage are you looking for? The thing is, is that if pigs are happy and they're fat and they're doing what they need to as far as nutritionally, they're not going to stick that snout in the ground. So you have to think about ways that they're leaving other sign behind that may not be obvious, like the rootings and things like that. So kind of keep that in mind with they, pigs are, are lazy if they have that opportunity to, but whenever it comes to time to sustain their life and, and to make sure that they can produce that next litter, that nose is going in the ground and they're going to make sure that they get what they need. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk about here in several different slides to come up uh, in, in succession here is going to be about disease. And, and one of the things that we need to think about with disease is that, that pigs have plenty of opportunity to spread some disease across the landscape that we'll talk about specifically coming up. But whenever we think about disease though, one of the main things we need to think about with disease is does every pig on the landscape carry disease? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, that's something that could they possibly have that? Yeah, it's, it's possible. Uh, it, it could be a situation that's there. But the thing we need to always think about with regard to disease is as you increase carrying capacity on a landscape, what do you do to the potential disease on the landscape? And obviously there's a direct correlation to as you put more animals on the landscape, the probability of disease also increases on the landscape. So the lower the population on the landscape, the lower the likelihood or the lower the percentages are that there'll be diseases on that landscape because they can spread out across that landscape and they're, they're more healthy. Animals with a, that are healthy have a higher functioning immune system, the disease possibilities uh, decrease. So that doesn't matter if it's pigs or if it's anything else on the landscape, that's just uh, standard disease uh, progressions and so forth. So kind of keep those things in mind as we move forward. Some of the things we need to think about with regard to, to agriculture is obviously the spreading of the disease among livestock. One of the places that we need to think about first and foremost with the possibility, again too, the stressing the word possibility of disease among livestock is at water sites. Like where I'm at right now in Texas, those livestock species have no choice to come to a uh, provided water source, whether that be a trough or a, a windmill or something of that nature, that water is a very precious commodity where I'm at. And where Marshall's at, they've been getting plenty of rain, 
they may have other, other water sources here that they can start landscape thing with, would disperse accordingly. But some of the more important ones that we need to think about with regard to disease among the livestock is one is brucellosis. Uh, brucella, the brucella bacteria has seven different strains of brucella that affect different things from sheep and goats to cattle to pigs and so forth and so on. And obviously the brucella uh, variety or version or uh, uh, type of brucella is what affects pigs. Now, back in the day, whenever some of y'all have cattle, you remember back in the day whenever you'd have to have a, a card test done at the, the cell barn before you could sell your cattle if it come up positive for brucella it didn't tell you the strain of brucella it just told you that they had it so in in lieu of taking chances on that disease spreading if it tested positive for brucellosis in general then you got quarantine and and it could very well be a completely benign version or variety strain of brucella that had no impact on your livestock but we didn't know that in those earlier stages so other things that come to mind whenever we think about anthrax i don't know anybody on the planet that whenever they hear the word anthrax doesn't come up with a negative response it just makes your skin crawl and, and shiver whenever you see that word and one of the things that we need to think about with anthrax is that 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 situation that individual disease or pathogen is spread through spores those spores are in the ground okay so some of the things to kind of keep in mind is is that there are endemic areas around the united states and around the world that have anthrax that just means they're there all the time and they're going to be and 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 where i'm at in texas we have that endemic zone of anthrax it basically goes from wichita falls all the way down to del rio I bring this up to say this, is that one thing that's come out in research, according to Ohio State University, is pigs are, the, are one of the only species, if not the only species out there, that is immune to anthrax. Well, whenever we think about that, it's like, well, that's unfortunate that anthrax isn't killing pigs. But the other thing out there is that anthrax being spore borne and the spores are in the ground, what does that say about land management? In situations that we're facing right now in, in Texas where there's an, an, an unbelievable drought, obviously grasses and forbs are grazed a heck of a lot closer to the ground, which obviously puts noses closer to the ground with regard to those spores. Next thing is, is that whenever pigs doesn't have the food source that they need to above ground to sustain themselves, they're gonna stick their nose in the ground. So as they start rooting in some of those endemic areas where the, the vegetation that, that that height of that vegetation is not maintained, now we have that possibility. And again, I use the word possibility of, of that anthrax being more airborne. And, and that's something that we need to kind of keep in mind is, is some of these diseases could possibly be a non-issue until you put the, the wrong variable in there. And sometimes that wrong variable is a pig. The last one there that we need to think about a little bit more specifically is pseudorabies. And the reason I bring pseudorabies up is, is because of some of the, the uh, legal methods to be able to hunt pigs include, uh, include dogs. Um, and one of the, the things to keep in mind is with pseudorabies, every species on the planet can catch pseudorabies, can get pseudorabies other than the hominids. So basically what that means is me and my pet monkey cannot catch pseudorabies, but you, your dog and your neighbor's dog is completely susceptible to pseudorabies. The problem is, is just like pseudo vaccines, is vaccines are not 100% effective. So you may have your, your dogs vaccinated and so forth and so on, but you're getting that marginal level of, of, of protection there. And again, we move back to where we say diseases are directly correlated to the population in the area. As those populations go up, where it's typically more, I guess, hunt opportunity for dogs, as those populations go up, so does that possibility that your dogs are going to encounter that pseudorabies problem. And, and that typically does not end well. And whenever I say typically, about 95% of the time that does not end well with your dogs. Uh, so again, that's going to be one of those, those other species, obviously, uh, that's susceptible to that, or your horses, your cattle, and everything else. Everything but the hominids. The other thing that we refer to as far as pigs are concerned, we call pigs a reservoir species. And whatever we mean by reservoir species is that, that we can find uh, research in the state of Texas and many other states that say pigs can, can possibly, again too possibly, carry up to 40 diseases. That doesn't mean that an individual pig is going to carry 40 diseases. 
Pigs may not carry a, a single disease in certain areas, but across the landscape, we can find a ton of different diseases where some states are reporting up above 60 different diseases that they found within their, the confines of their states. Whenever I say a, re a reservoir species, if we want to go to a landscape, any landscape that we have out there to determine whether or not a disease is prevalent on that landscape, we don't go, need to go out there and look for micro uh, uh, species or we don't look for micro settings to find out whether or not there's a disease there. All we need to do is go out and, and, and find a pig or two, pull disease or pull blood, blood or tissue samples off of, off of pigs in an area because if an area has a disease that that's, um, can be found, pigs are likely going to be a carrier. So whenever we want to do some quick and down and dirty disease assessments in an area, pigs are a definite reservoir for anything that could be there. Uh, moving on down to the next slide there, we seen earlier in that, that or that previous slide with that, that deer fawn there that was on the, the bad end of a pig, um, we know whenever we say that we couldn't quantify uh, predation in wildlife species because we didn't know what we started with at the beginning of that season. On livestock, we have the, the opposite of that. Whenever we have livestock being born, uh, most livestock producers, livestock managers know exactly the number of kid goats, lambs, calves that are born to, to a specific breeding season or birthing season. So we can definitely go in and quantify the losses uh, of those livestock species just because we knew what we started with. And when we start thinking about that, the, 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 the thing that's kind of chilling for me where I'm at in Texas is that now for years and years, wild pigs have been the number two predator on kid goats and lambs in the state of Texas, only behind the coyote. So that's a little bit chilling just because of the livestock implications that's there. But the other thing to think about too is what other baby that's being born on the landscape is about the same size of a kid goat or a lamb. Whenever we start thinking about native species and that same size, I guess, at birth, we're looking at deer fawns as well. So if we know that, the, that those livestock species can sustain some pretty, pretty heavy damages in certain areas, then if we're under, under certain conditions like stress, drought or anything like that, then we can see our deer fawns taking it on the chin as well. And some of those that may be out there with those high fenced operations that still have pigs in those high fenced operations, those, those does can't move those deer fawns out of an area to try to stay away from those pigs as easily as they can on an open landscape. So kind of keep some of those things in mind as you're thinking about predation of livestock with regard to your native species as well. And obviously the destruction of crops and field and agriculture infrastructure. Uh, we definitely see some massive damages across our crops every year. And it seems to be that it's getting more impactful every year on those crops, which makes perfect sense because as we see those land fragmentation uh, likelihoods increase, where we're moving land out of agriculture into human habitation, that means that those agriculture lands are being more uh, condensed and, and higher productivity demands on those landscapes or those crop fields. Yeah, those animals are now gonna concentrate their feeding efforts to a, a confined area, and we're gonna see those damages increase uh, throughout, the, throughout the Southeastern United States. Uh, we see a lot of problems now in our fields and, and, and agriculture infrastructure but due to, to hay field uh, rootings and things of that nature. And then agriculture infrastructure could very well be your roadways. Whenever we see road ditches that has a little water in there or where a culvert crosses the road and that's the last place to hold water in a given area, as those pigs start to wallow and root out in those areas, those, those, those moist areas to stay cool, so goes our infrastructure the next time we have a runoff rain, big, big flood. So uh, there's, there's places that really nothing is being left unturned with, with pigs uh, in agriculture. So now we'll move a little bit more into that disease uh, uh, implications or disease possibility. And whenever we start doing this, we're really, again, too, going to treat this like a motorboat. We're going to hit the high spots because later on, as you've seen in that, that uh, progression of these webinars, we're going to be dedicating uh, one specific webinar completely to the possibilities of disease and how diseases move across the landscape. So we're not going to go into a whole heck of a lot of depth there other than just bringing your awareness to some of the possibilities. 
is kind of wrap things up with some thoughts on some diseases. And, and one of the things that we need to think about is about a dozen or so, a little over a dozen or an audit, which means people can get them. Uh, that just makes means that those of you that, that choose to use those pigs as a food source, uh, make sure that you're taking care of that, that animal appropriately, and which means taking care of you appropriately. If you're going to dress those animals out and put those in the freezer on the barbecue pit, making sure that, that everything is good. Now, we'll get into this a lot more detail uh, whenever we specifically talk about disease in a few months. But one of the things to make sure of is that, that the diseases that could potentially be there are something that if you follow good food safety handling situations and cooking protocols and so forth and so on, it's nothing that you need to concern yourself with. So make sure that you cook that meat accordingly and, and, uh, and it'll, be, it'll be healthy to, to consume. The other thing is though, is if you have a, any question in your mind that we need to, or that, that there's any questions about the health of that animal, obviously don't don't use that as human consumption we've got nine million of them across the united states so get one of those animals that are that, that look healthy that that appears to be operating in the way that they need to and uh and then that way you can put that one on the barbecue pit or in the freezer if there's any questions in mind it's nothing that you want to take a chance on so uh Aaron, and that's the include all screen? of those air we might i'm yeah. sorry are you sharing your screen yeah so but i mean it's basically just nothing but but talking points right now. So it's not really anything that you'd really need to see. And, okay. and pretty much that's where we're gonna wrap things up tonight is just that that food safety uh, concern is that if you follow good protocol and handling procedures and so forth and so on, um, that's not anything that you need to lose sleep over. Just make sure that whenever you, uh, you, you take care of those animals that you take care of yourself first and everything will be suffice. So basically with that, then that's what, where we're going to end tonight and, and turn it over to Q&A anyway. So if anybody's got any Q&A, then this is, this is where we'll take it, Vicki. Marshall, what you got? Couldn't seem, seem to be a problem lately. Can you help? Oh, yeah, that's, it has been a problem it lately. Is, we just brought this up at a meeting. Um, there's, a, there, there's been a couple novel ideas that have been shared on the Facebook users group. Uh, one of them, um, was to take a board that's slightly shorter than your trap cap and basically just drill a hole about three inches from the end and create an escape ladder for the raccoons. Um, you know, just keep it so that it, it swings freely so it'd be a couple inches off the ground and just support it with a zip tie. Um, the owner that, that had recommended that tip said it works just really, really good. So um, we had that thought and cargo netting too. Uh, the other possibility is, is uh, if they're if they're going to the trap cap in a specific location all the time, it's totally fine to cut, you know, basically one piece of mesh to create a big enough opening where they can just slip out. Um, the the likelihood that you would have an escape through that hole is really really small, so uh, I don't think that that would be problematic. Marshall, got any extra tips? Um, one I would would go with would be uh staying away from sweets um anything that has a sweet aroma is going to draw of course draw more raccoons um just sticking with your basic sour corn um your sour rice bran um your liquid fence type stuff um is is gonna decrease possibly decrease the number that you're seeing i mean they're they're gonna eat everything that a pig eats so Keeping them away from the bait um, is, is, is a challenge. You can also, um, if it's allowed in your state and you have a trapping license already, um, you can put out some dog proofs um, away from your trap and, and just start catching them. Awesome. I have another question. Um, how about honeybee hives? And forgive me if I'm not articulating the entire question, but um if you want to ask a little bit in more detail but someone's asking about honey beehives maybe honey beehives and pigs we don't tend to see too much damage with honey beehives and pigs um certainly they're opportunists so if they have the ability to to knock a hive over and get into the honey uh it'll likely happen uh, bears tend to be a a bigger raider of honey beehives than <laughs> pigs do but um yeah i would certainly 
if I had hives, I would be running an electric fence around them to, to keep the pigs off. I was about to suggest the same thing. Yeah, I'd probably run two strands. You know, I'd run a strand maybe four or six inches off the ground, and then I'd run another one probably at somewhere between a foot and 18 inches. Um, yeah, that would be, that'd be your best bet just to keep them off the hives. It's a little more difficult if you have them scattered out over a wide, wide area. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that if they have the, the opportunity to knock a hive over, they'll get after the honey. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Um, and then somebody else is asking, what should I use to clean the mesh after the pigs defecate on the mesh? And how do I store it? Um, when I clean, like when I get one that's muddy or bloody, um, what I, I do is I just spray it with plain water and a hose um, and to let it air dry. Um, if it's hot, it'll dry out within a day. Um, if you're expecting rain, I probably would just lay it out um, and let let it get rained on. Um, that's going to help wash some of the dirt and mud off of it anyway. Then what I would, would do um, is I would get a uh, somewhere between 45 and, and 50 gallon tote um, and put it in there. Um, dry. You've got to let it be completely dry before you store it, or you'll get mold and mildew that grows on it, uh, and it'll smell horrible when you do open it back up. <laughs> we do have some tote recommendations. If you want to reach out, we can send links. I think they're both action packers, but we've gotten gotten that down pretty good. Um, yeah, anything I, else? Just to add to that real quickly, uh, we have heard of a few customers taking their nets to the spray car wash and hanging it on the mat hooks and just spraying it off. And they claim that that works well. I've got a pressure washer at home and pressure wash mine, but the spray car wash is probably a, a good bet if you don't have a, a pressure washer. Um, we're drawing pigs in constantly on our first three sets. Now I'm having trouble drawing it, drawing pigs in. What am I doing wrong? Well, quite likely you're not doing anything wrong. Um, it's just the thing that right now, I don't know, where you're located is there a way that you can let us know where you're at in the country and maybe be able to, to give some more insight specifically but a lot of things that are happening right now across the southeast is they're harvesting crops and whenever they're harvesting crops there's going to be a ton of grain spillage on the ground and so forth and so on that's going to give those pigs a just unbelievable food resource for a short period of time and those animals could be scattering because of other resources that are in the area uh, that would be the first thing that would come to mind. Uh, the other things that could be coming to mind is that just depending on the, the sounder movements, they may have moved out of the area, um, just, just re, I guess, depleted the food resources in those areas and they'll be back on you sooner or later. But the main thing to think about is if they are, I guess, hesitant to come to a trap location, then don't force them. Uh, if they are being reluctant, then what this may be the perfect time to do is to, to do a little trap maintenance and, and make sure that your trap is ready to go. Because if you push those pigs to do something that they're not willing to do, you're very prone to push them away. Uh, so if those animals are, are, are reluctant, the best thing I can tell you to do in that situation is bait that trap site, whether or not the net is there or not, bait that trap site and just watch it to see when those pigs start coming back to that location. And as soon as those pigs start coming back to that location, then, then chances are then uh, those, those, I guess, uh, temporary food resources have, have depleted themselves and, uh, and you'll see successes go up. But don't force those animals. If they're not willing to play the game, you can make them really quit the game. But Marshall and Ryan, if y'all got anything else to add, um, please feel free to do so. No, I go. I, I responded just about the exact same thing you did in the in the chat. That you know, depending on what state you're in, there's a lot of natural food resources available. Here in Indiana, we've had plenty of rain. Um, a lot of our vegetable crops are ripening. You know, sweet corns only. Geez, we're probably maybe a week out on sweet corn here. So, uh, really good feed for pigs in the southern part of the state along the Ohio River Valley right now. So, it'd be super difficult to get pigs to come to a trap. Um, like I said, it, it depends on where you're located in the U.S. If you're in one of those states that getting plenty of water and uh, crops are ripening, yeah, it's going to be tough. 
Yeah, the other thing to kind of keep in mind, too, is that we, we see this spike right now in, in excess food resources for those pigs. If you're in an area where, where you've got a lot of oak trees or pecans or anything like that, kind of check out those possibilities of food resources in the early part of the fall. Uh, typically, that's when we'll see people start to question what they're doing, if it's right or wrong. Uh, but whenever we have those big mass producing trees start dropping nuts and things like that, we'll see that wane uh, in, in efficiencies until they, they pick those natural food sources up. So there's definitely peaks and valleys. And we'll talk about that, too, in a couple of months uh, about when we really need to, to hammer those 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 management opportunities hard. And when there's appropriate times to somewhat back off and let those pigs be pigs for a little while um, before stepping in again. All right, I have um, I have another question for you. I have trapped pigs twice, but I have no signs of rooting recently. But I have started to have a few bears coming around. How do bears and pigs interact, react to each other? Well, the short of it is, is pigs do not like bears showing up to the family reunion. Uh, so when you think about pigs and bears, that's that's something that that yeah an adult pig doesn't see a bear too much as a problem but whenever they've got smaller animals within that sounder uh, they're going to collectively stay away from bears uh, just because of that that possibility of, of um, bears bears seeing pigs as a food resource so the other thing about that is catching pigs on the the, the with with really no sign on the ground itself uh, that's not, it's not kind of what we talked about a little bit earlier is that pigs are lazy and if you've got adequate food resources above ground, they're not gonna stick their nose in the ground. So those obvious signs are not gonna be there until those above ground resources are depleted where we can see those pigs now seeing no other option than to stick their nose in the ground. Uh, so the, 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 the thing with the bears is, is right now, uh, as we speak, literally, uh, we have research projects in the field to look at ways that we can keep bears back from the, those trap sites without deterring the pigs as well. So definitely stay tuned uh, in the coming months. Hopefully, for sure, we'll have something that's, that's, that's definitely uh, researched and, and, and focused on within, I guess now I'm looking at the September meeting is Bates and Bates elections. Uh, we may be able to have you something by then on bait deterrence for bears. Uh, if, if not by September, hopefully by October, October when we talk about avoiding non-target species. Guys, do you have anything else to add? All right. No, that's 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 a good answer. No, I think that's good. And I think there was a question above that, that just how do deer, bears, and mountain lions um, act around the trap? Do they have any problems getting in or out? And whether or not the trap cap um, is a help or hindrance for that? And do you want to answer that, Marshall, or you want me to go ahead and make a run at it? What do you want to do there? Yeah, definitely. Um, with uh, in in regards with the trap cap, if you're having a a lot of deer interaction with the trap, um, we recommend starting with bait, um, starting out with the liquid fence. Um, if you see that they're still coming in, um, willing to put up with a little bit of harassment um, from that, then what we suggest is is running a an electric fence around the trap. Um, with some peanut, instead of the fence, electric fence wire, use the electric fence tape um, and smearing peanut butter on it. Um, so that way, when they go up and lick it, they get a nice surprise. Um, with bears, um, we've had, uh, we had a customer have a bear in his trap. He banged around on the inside and eventually he climbed out um, with, with no damage to the trap itself. Um, I don't have any experience with mountain lions um, being around the trap. Um, they're pretty sparse down here. Um, do you have anything? Yeah, just generally, well, I, I haven't had a single call with mountain lions either, but they're they're excellent climbers. I, I wouldn't suspect that there would be any problem. Um, if, a, if a customer has a trap cap on their trap and it's sewn in and they're worried about mountain lions, um, getting stuck in the trap, what I'd likely do is I'd just unclip it at the seam. So right at the top of the track cap where the five carabiners go across the top, I'd probably just unhook those and then just tie that back down to the, to the um, 
base net or bore shield and just kind of pull that back and pleat it down. And that'll give them a good place to climb up. There shouldn't be any problems with them getting out. And an adult mountain lion can probably flat foot it right over a five foot, <laughs> you know, five foot. Well, there, just like a couple deer. of a couple of things to come to mind on that with with regard to the deer and the and the lions is is one on the 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 lions. A lot of times uh, there's going to not be a reason for that line if that trap is in the set mode for that line to push under that net. So one, they're going to have to climb in to be able to climb out. So if they can get in it, they can get out of it. Uh, if they, if, if the, where we would see, I think more of an issue with uh, interference from lions at a trap site would just be the fact that if they're spreading any of their smells around that trap site, it's pushing those pigs back just based on odor rather than the actual physical presence of that animal. Uh, because we see that even with coyotes and, and, uh, and in several places. And I mean, that's something that we think of in, in Texas, whenever we've got a lot of small pigs within that sounder is if there's coyotes that have been coming to a trap just for the simple fact of checking to see what's there, those coyotes may be preying on your raccoons at the trap uh, but just the smell of those animals there will keep those those sounders pushed back if they've got smaller animals in the sounder. Where I don't see that there would be a whole I a big issue with with lions or coyotes or anything like that having an incentive to push under to in order to have to to figure out a way to get out. The other thing with deer, the the we'll cover all of these during those those September October programs. But the deer the deer avoidance is going to be more of a human behavior, a human uh, tendency, because if we if we bait those traps in the morning at nine or 10 o'clock, we give deer access to that trap all day long before we can anticipate pigs uh, coming to that trap location. Whereas if we, like whenever I bait my traps is, is I typically bait those traps within an hour of dark. Whenever I bait them within an hour of dark, dark it shortens the time from the time I bait that trap to the time I expect pigs, which means I shorten the time that deer have access to those traps without pigs getting there. Uh, same thing with raccoons. I mean, whenever, if pigs are already at a location or at a trap site, coons are not gonna come in. So if we bait those and kind of change our, our personal behaviors, we can avoid a lot of those non-targets. But again, too, like I said, we'll get into this, I mean, net deep whenever we get into those September and October programs. So we need to pass the word around about those two events coming up. Yes, definitely. Um, Aaron, this is a good question for you. Will this terrible drought in North Texas cause a pit, cause a hog to die off or, or will just a small amount of pasture water allow their survival? Yeah, the, the short answer of this is no, we're not gonna see any pig die off in, in, in the drought that we're having right now. I mean, Texas obviously is getting smoked just like Oklahoma and in and, uh, and, and Kansas is with, the, with regard to the drought. But where we're gonna see is that those pigs are gonna gravitate to those water sources, whether it be a river, a creek or a large stock pond. And basically, just because the ability of that pig to stick his nose in the ground and find enough food to stay alive, that's all they're trying to do right now is just to stay alive. So the one thing that y'all need to think about in North Texas or in some of those peripheral areas is that places that may not have had pigs before, after we break out of this drought, they very likely will have pigs again or have pigs uh, uh, now is because those pigs, once they get to those water thoroughfares, they're going to travel along those corridors of those rivers and creeks and, and whatnot to find enough food. And that may take them very, very far out of where they normally called a range. And as soon as it starts to, the, to rain again and the, the land starts to recover, wherever they're at in that travel pattern, they come out of those watersheds. They may be in completely new areas that people have never seen pigs before. And now we have a, a breeding population that used the drought as an incentive to move to places that they've never been. But no, we're not, we're not going to see, we're not going to see pigs die out from this drought. It's just not going to happen because the other thing to think about in North Texas and West Texas, uh, Western Oklahoma, Western Kentucky or Western Kansas is that anywhere that there is livestock, we have to have a water source. And if there's livestock water sources there, then pigs are going to indirectly benefit from that water source. So if, if, if livestock is not dying from this drought, pigs are not going to die from this drought either. So, but a very, very excellent question there, because this is where we see pigs populate areas that they've never populated before is immediately following a drought. 
That was awesome. I learned something there. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. <laughs> Seriously, I didn't. I, I didn't realize that the limited water would um, lead to the expansion of feral pig populations. So that yeah, was they will. They'll. I mean, there's, there's. I guess little, little niches of quality habitat that are out there, no matter what the climatic conditions are, and those pigs are going to use the water is obviously a sustaining uh, factor for life. And I mean, literally in a drought. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of pigs now along the Texas Gulf Coast that the widest part of their body is literally their head. It looks like a walking cross tie. And, and they're just hoping to hold on to life until it starts raining again. And as soon as it starts raining again, then those pigs are going to absolutely explode into areas that they may have never been before. Um, and then they will absolutely get into breeding condition extremely, extremely quick. And this is something that we saw in Texas during the 2011 drought. And for some of y'all that, that are in Texas, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say 2011. But we, I was trapping pigs for Texas A&M in 2011. And we did a mark recapture, which means we caught them, we marked them, and we turned them loose just to see if we could catch them again. And what we did is at the time that we caught them, those pigs were literally nothing but skin and bones. And within six to eight weeks, it had started raining, plus the pecans had started dropping nuts. We went from pigs that were barely holding on to life, literally six to eight weeks later, those same pigs that we had marked for a recapture were bred. So it doesn't take long. I mean, it's just like a wildflower in the desert. As soon as it gets a little bit of water, it's going to go through a complete life cycle in a very short period of time. I think that's it, unless anybody else has any questions. Yeah, another thing, folks, too, definitely keep in mind, pass the word about around to, to the folks that are out there that, that need, to, need to hear a little bit more about pigs or get involved in this discussion, but also, too, uh, looking at those programs that we have coming up for you, if there's something that we are not going to address moving forward with these programs, let us know because then we can have a second meeting during a month and or we can add that into place for something else and we can make sure we get it addressed. Uh, but just make sure that you let us know what, what you're facing so we know how to better help you. Um, real quick, uh, with deer season coming up, uh, pretty quick upon all of us uh, down here. Um, what would you recommend as far as deterrence um, on the deer uh, from the traps? Yeah, to keep deer away from the trap, the one thing that Marshall, you even hit, you hit this just a minute ago, uh, what we are seeing some very, very positive responses on uh, all the way from Texas to Arkansas, all the way to Georgia, Marshall, where you're at in South Carolina, is that the, 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 the deer do not like that emulsified egg solids. And basically that's rotted eggs. And you can buy that under a couple of different product names straight off the shelf. And what we do is we just bait that trap however you decide to bait that trap. And we apply that emulsified egg solid over the top of that bait with just a pump up sprayer. We mix it at twice the strength is what it says on the, on the container. And we top mist that bait um, uh, with that, that emulsified egg solid. I definitely would not treat your trap because that stuff stinks. And I don't know that you want to be in contact with a stinky trap for a long period of time, but the, definitely the emulsified egg solids keep those, those animals back or those deer back. And Marshall, you even alluded to this a little bit earlier too about the electric fence. Um, Guys, there's there's two videos that we've got coming out very, very quickly for you that's going to show you two different electric fence designs uh, that, that may be something to think about as we move forward with, the, with the, the deer season and so forth. The biggest thing for me as a deer hunter to think about with moving forward and how you use your traps with the deer avoidance is making sure that those that, that, that trap is either all the way up in conditioning mode or all the way down into catch mode. Uh, we don't want to gradually lower that trap down that we may be able to do in the spring of the year in the fall of the year. So it's either all the way up or all the way down in the fall year, fall of the year to, to take away some of that, that deer um, uh, issue. All right. You guys have any more questions for us? Well, folks, I yes. appreciate y'all y'all coming in tonight using a, an hour of your time to, to spend with us and again too moving forward into the upcoming months um, Marshall and Ryan are going to be 
as as heavily involved with this as I am because they definitely have insights in their parts of the country. So uh, just keep those questions coming. It doesn't matter if it's on a Thursday night that we're covering it in, in a formal way with a webinar, but keep those questions coming and definitely let's make sure that we're passing out good information to help people out with their big issues. Yeah, de definitely. And if, at any point you guys have any questions, give uh, give Ryan, Aaron, or myself a call. Um, we'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, all folks. Appreciate you. Thank you. all